Hello, my name is Jim Mayer. I'm a training specialist with the Illinois Center for Transition and Work, and I'm going to be speaking with you today about job analysis and job carving. Job analysis and job carving are two very useful strategies you can utilize to effectively assist individuals with high support needs in finding successful employment. A little about my background. I'm a certified rehab counselor with areas of specialization in supported employment and special education. My work experience includes 15 years in adult services, where I coordinated a supported employment program, and 21 years in the schools, where I was a regional coordinator of a career planning and work experience program for transition-aged students. Our objectives for today are twofold. Job analysis and job carving are strategies that are more commonly discussed in the world of adult services. I hope you will find, as I have, that they can be extremely useful in our efforts to help students with disabilities move towards and into successful employment. I hope this information will, will bolster you in your work and give you some valuable techniques to assist you and your students in gaining access to work experiences and employment. In the first half of the presentation, I will cover job analysis. In the second half, we will discuss strategies for job carving and negotiation with the potential employer. Job analysis and job carving are strategies common to supported employment, which is now commonly referred to as customized employment. OSERS, the Office of Special Education and Rehabilitative Services, in its definition of customized employment, highlights a number of strategies that I will be covering in this presentation. Namely, I will be focusing on how job analysis and job carving techniques can be utilized to A, produce a customized job description based on employer needs and the interests and skills of our targeted student. B, include provisions for the optimal arrangement of duties, scheduling, workstation, and supervision. And C, use job analysis information to work with the employer on details of job placement and support. Now we'll launch into part one of the presentation, job analysis. Based on comprehensive transition assessment information you've gathered with and for your student, the next step is to identify those employers who you think may be a good fit for your student. Then take a deep dive into getting to know these employers. Job analysis is a very focused way of learning about the needs, assets, and particularities of, of potential employers while developing relationships and looking for win-win possibilities. It involves looking critically at a business's way of doing things with an eye for how they might be done better with the help of your student and your program. Good job analysis involves simultaneously gathering information that will help all parties involved in making good decisions as to whether an employment or work experience situation could make sense for the business, the student, and the program. Consider sites where you may find a good fit for an individual student or a range of potential work-based learning experience opportunities for multiple students. And consider sites where good training experiences could lead to employment. Finally, realize not every analysis will result in a good fit necessarily. All right, now we're going to talk about this overall process. Bear in mind these, these multiple steps. First, you want to gather student profile and assessment information, including career interest surveys, observations at work experience sites, vocational skill assessments, and input from parents, guardians, and other support people. Secondly, we want to gather information about potential employers, including on-site job analysis based on observations, informational interviews, work tryouts, etc. Thirdly, we want to look for the best matches. Using both the business and student analysis data, we want to create sort of a comparison chart with pros and cons of, of various sites. And then finally, and fourthly, we want to consider possible plans for job modifications, which may include job carving, and which should include a proposed set of training services. All right, now we have this graphic showing our end result of the process, which is ideally an excellent match between the student worker and the job, thus between employer and employee. All right, so we're going to look at job analysis 
from the vantage point of five important factors. So these, these five factors um, are really important for both student assessment and job site analysis. I'm going to lead you through a job analysis process by detailing considerations within these five factors. This process was created in 2007 by my former colleagues, Sue Ann Morrow and Tom Sechrist, as part of the training materials we developed for employment specialists through the University of Illinois Region 5 Rehabilitation Continuing Education Program. There are other published forms and systems for job analysis, but not all of them include these five important factors. So whether you choose to use the Moro Sechrist format or another, please keep these five factors in mind. For example, factor number five, culture of the workplace, can be a very key consideration. All right, now we're going to launch into that first factor of preferences. We're going to look at work types, appealing jobs, and career development opportunities. So firstly, in terms of work types, we're going to be looking not only at the variety of formal positions that exist at that site, but also at the variety of tasks that need to be completed at the business, sort of within various job descriptions. We're going to be looking at appealing jobs, um, really, you know, tasks that might be uh, appealing to our student or students, tasks either within jobs or uh, possibilities for alternative job descriptions. And then finally, under career development, we want to be looking to see, uh, you know, what career development opportunities are available there and which will be accessible to our student. So the overall approach here is to look creatively at what is currently available and what might be possible with job uh, modification, systematic training, adaptive equipment, job carving, et cetera. All right, our second factor is logistics. Here we wanna look at schedule and travel. So under, under schedule, um, you know, some key questions to get answers to are, uh, you know, find out if shifts are set or if they're rotating. For example, do staff work rotating weekends? Uh, find out when part-time versus full-time shifts are available, and is there any flexibility in that? Uh, look at busy versus less busy shifts, and and look at things like might a person train during those less busy times. Um, under travel, some considerations there would be, uh, you know, is public transit available and reliable? Uh, how far is the walk to the bus stops that would be involved in that? Uh, do many of the employees, the current employees at this site, use the city buses? Uh, is ride sharing a common thing or carpooling? Um, so your approach here is to think creatively based on what you know about your student, you know, their, their family situation, their friend network. Um, are those possible ride opportunities uh, that exist for them. Uh, could an extra part-time shift during the busiest time of the day be useful? And uh, might those busiest times uh, when your, your student might be most needed, do those happen to coincide with public transportation availability? For instance, you know, in other words, are there possible um, possibility of creating some shifts that would, would, would be possible for your student to, to get there and to be most helpful? All right, our next consideration is financial concerns. So we're going to look at four different aspects of that. First of all, under incentives, uh, many of us need to realize that many of us work for perks other than salary. Um, and then also, uh, there may be some uh, employer incentives that could be a possibility. For instance, the Work Opportunity Tax Credit, WOTC, uh, I have found that to be of most interest to some of the larger companies who have the you know, legal and bookkeeping resources to access that particular uh, governmental incentive. Uh, under salary, we want to find out when evaluations occur, uh, what is expected to get a raise, uh, you know, is it automatic or merit-based, and then within that, how is merit measured? Um, under benefits, it's important to, um, you know, gain information for our individual student and for their family. Uh, we also want to be aware that of, of possible public benefits uh, that that student may be um, may qualify for that might be affected by working. And we want to be aware of, you know, various opportunities within that. You know, for instance, the student might be able to seek uh, work incentive program assistance uh, through the Division of Rehab Services. Uh, they have an office for that. And then Social Security 
for their various disability programs offer work incentives as well. There's information available, readily available on, on those opportunities. And then finally, under promotion opportunities, you know, we want to look at kind of the traditional and you know, what you might consider non-traditional promotion opportunities. So for instance, just a, an increase in work hours and duties over time might be a potential promotion that our student worker may be able to uh, succeed in. All right, our next factor we're going to look at is performance. We're going to look at uh, a number of, of points within that. Uh, first off, strength. Um, in addition to looking at the minimum requirements, be thinking about potential aids, for example, carts or racks, uh, and whether the heaviest work can be spread out over the shift. For example, you know, it might be possible for a worker to alternate between heavy duties, lighter duties, heavy duties, et cetera. And uh, under endurance, uh, in addition to observing the typical work's uh, pace uh, there, we want to note whether breaks must follow a strict reg strict regimen or if there appears to be some flexibility in that. For example, might they allow shorter, more frequent breaks? Under quality, we want to note whether coworkers typically help check one another's work. If not, does this seem like a reasonable thing to suggest? Are there quality checklists? that exist? Or perhaps is there a tool or device that can check quality that, that uh, is present or that we might be able to bring to the, to the situation for our student? All right, continuing on with performance, a few other factors to look at. First being speed and some of the you know, concerns there might be, can rate be enhanced with adaptive equipment? And I can give a, a quick example of that. I worked with a, a group of young women uh, in adult services who uh, were really interested in kind of craft-oriented work, wanted indoor work, seated work was their preference. And there was a uh, a local company that packaged some craft-type items. And uh, I helped these individuals obtain a piece of equipment that they actually were able to co-own after getting a grant from uh, the Division of Rehab Services. And this piece of equipment helped them increase their, their speed and their accuracy and um, basically leveled the playing field for these individuals. So uh, under learning style, some things to look at. Are, are allowances currently being made to accommodate differences in employees during the training phase uh, in particular? Uh, is coworker coaching allowed or perhaps encouraged? Uh, under academics, some things to look at. I, you know, is it okay to use aids like counting devices, uh, pictorial or verbal instructions? Uh, little kind of alarm systems to 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 keep a person on track and, and remind them of various things in their shift. Those would all be you know possible adaptations that 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 uh, you know could be considered to help with if there's a, a little gap there with some of the academic skills. And then finally, under mobility, uh, do some jobs require less mobility than others? Uh, can individuals use carts or scooters to get around? Um, is it necessary to use stairs or steps in the workplace? And if so, are there elevators or other possible workarounds, ramps, elevators, et cetera? Okay, moving on to the final considerations under performance. So uh, medication uh, considerations. Uh, the, the, big, the big question I have found there to, to look at is, is it feasible for a person to take their breaks uh, to coincide with, you know, when they might need to take a, an important medication. Um, as far as routines, do, do there appear to be allowances made around skill and preference? You know, for example, uh, could a worker with less endurance uh, maybe do less walking uh, and do some of the, the more of the seated tasks at that that uh, department? And the, could could a more uh, kinetic, let's say, coworker um, do more of that footwork um, if that's their preference? Um, as far as environment. Um, some questions to look at as far as environmental demands would be, are workers allowed to use things like noise canceling headphones, for instance, or other types of equipment that might help with that, in, you know, with environmental concerns like, uh, you know, can a person wear gloves uh, if that's uh, beneficial to them? Uh, can they use a fan for, for staying cool? Um, can they use a stool if there's, you know, uh, a lot of standing involved? Some of those kinds of things in the work environment. All right, and then finally, now we're going to move on to our fifth and final factor of culture of the workplace. So the considerations here start out with supervision and support. So some key questions to ask here. Is there a lot of turnover among the supervisors um, and or coworkers? 
Are coworkers encouraged to help one another? Do supervisors use a kind tone in giving feedback? Uh, under reinforcement, uh, in addition to the pay schedule, are there any other fun or interesting perks? Like, for instance, you know, does the workplace have a, a you know, a, a donut day uh, if, if uh, they've had a good week, for instance? Or are there some seasonal or special gifts that they give away to employees? Do the employees get an early out at the end of a really successful, productive work week? Those are just some of those typical things you might look at under reinforcement. Under orientation and training, is it acceptable for a job coach to assist in, let's say, some of those uh, early trainings, those computer modules, and some of those kinds of things. Many employers are open to that kind of assistance. Are there pre-employment requirements like drug testing, background checks, first aid training, et cetera? Um, and again, you, you kind of be looking out for, is that something that your student might need assistance with? And is there periodic in-service training, which could be you know, helpful, but also a concern as far as, you know, maybe needing to see, again, if a job coach could help a student with those periodic uh, trainings. So under communication, we'd want to look at uh, things like, are our coworkers generally supportive of one another at this site? Uh, is there a lot of joking and teasing that happens at work? And if so, is it easy or hard to participate in that? Uh, do they have potlucks or other special events periodically there, either at work or related to to the work group? Um, and, and you know, again, looking could our student access those those activities and enjoy them uh, under appearance? Some some things to look at are, are you know would be are there hair, jewelry, or clothing restrictions around safety or decorum that uh, might or might not be an issue for our individual? And then finally, behavior. Um, you know, what are the written and unwritten rules of what is acceptable at this site? Um, are there enough good role models for a student who may struggle in understanding rules and limits? All right, now we're going to proceed into part two, negotiation and job carving. After you have completed a job analysis, it may be time to negotiate with the business by discussing a proposal for employment. Uh, or for a work-based learning experience, depending on the goal uh, for your particular student. So your proposal should, in, should consider the following. First, um, ideas for possible job modifications or adaptations. Uh, secondly, matching your student's strengths and interests with employer needs. You want to kind of map out what this could look like. So thirdly, you want to be proactively ready to, add, uh, to address and problem solve any employer concerns. Fourthly, you want to develop a plan that creates a win-win for your student, the employer, and your program. Really a win-win-win, right? And finally, you want to be careful not to promise anything you can't deliver. It's much better to promise only what you know you have the resources to provide. Then if you find you can go beyond this, wonderful. All right, so next we're going to look at some possible concerns an employer might express about this plan that you're that you're proposing. And we'll talk about some potential responses you might offer to them. So first, they may want to know, uh, could, could our efficiency be affected by bringing in this student worker? So what you want to do is demonstrate how your student is likely to respond to the training plans you've developed based on this you know, wonderful job analysis information that you have. Uh, talk about the likely payoff that that uh, employer may receive in terms of, of potential worker longevity after what might be you know, a, a somewhat longer learning curve initially. Um, so uh, another concern they might express would be, um, will the coworkers accept your student workers? So um, some possible solutions here. You may be able to offer some disability awareness training at that job site. You might even you know, offer those workers who attended uh, some kind of a certificate of completion uh, to kind of build them up, build those coworkers up as potential support people for the long-term success of your student. And really, uh, that disability awareness may help that employer in other ways, in terms of being aware of customers um, and others who they they interface with in the in in their community. So um, a third question might be uh, ADA compliance. You know, can I, the, the employer want to know can I can I afford to make reasonable accommodations your student may need? So so your response might include. You know, providing ideas for some accommodations that may be either no cost or low cost. Um, it may even involve 
you know, if there's expense involved, it might be possible that you could do, as I mentioned earlier that I've done, which is to uh, look at your student obtaining some kind of uh, grant or assistance with, with obtaining some equipment they need so that it's not an imposition uh, on that employer. Um, another concern an employer might express is, um, you know, what if this doesn't work out? Can I can I terminate the student worker? So, um, you know, part of your response to this would be, you know, hopefully if you've done a good job in, in job matching, job analysis, and, and have had and have, have a really sound training plan, then this will hopefully not even become an issue. But um, you know, it, it it may also be helpful to remind that employer that this is going to be an employment relationship. Uh, where the student's going to need to follow company policies for employment. And, and with that, um, you know, you, it might help for you to, to, to sort of, again, remind them that you uh, and your uh, school program are there to, to help problem solve and to, to, again, hopefully help remedy any, any um, uh, bumps in the road. Um, that that may, uh, you know, cause concern for that employer. And then finally, uh, the employer may be worried about, you know, what if this student needs long-term support after they've, you know, aged out of the school program or graduated. Uh, so it may help here to let the business know that if needed, if that, that student does end up needing some longer-term support, that that might be something you can assist with, that, that there are some resources out there uh, through adult services that you might be able to talk with the Division of Rehab Services, for instance, see if they could help fund some um, some follow-up job coaching or um, uh, ongoing services that that student may need. All right. Now to move on into job carving, let's start out with just some... Um, definitions um, and to really talk about when you might use job carving. So um, first off, to, just to look at this definition. So job carving defined is, is a restructure or redesign of an existing job or jobs to better fit the capabilities of the person performing it. Uh, the use of it is when you find uh, a potential match that appears ideal except for a few performance related aspects. Um, you know, some things that we might be able to to look at uh, some workarounds with. Uh, thirdly, we'd want to be focusing here on some subtasks within current job descriptions that your student could enjoy and perform well. And we want to really key in on with this some tasks that could save the business money or increase their efficiency. So it's really uh, taking that deeper dive into job analysis to do a more detailed study of those performance aspects. And, you know, looking at, at job redesign is, uh, it's, it's a way for you to uh, find, you know, find an effective job. It's one that your student can do, wants to do, and one that has value to the organization. So some tips for proposing job carving. Uh, you want to look at all the tasks that need to be completed at that business. Uh, and here's here's the key one. This second point is to listen very carefully to any concerns the employer is expressing about things that, let's say, aren't getting getting done efficiently, that their workers are having trouble getting to, um, things that you might be able to help with, you and your student. Uh, thirdly, you want to ask questions to help uh, pinpoint some of those areas of current inefficiencies um, or tasks. And um, and then finally, you want to identify some potential tasks for job carving. So, you know, my advice is you enter this study with the humble belief that there's always a better method for doing things. So ask if you can observe and shadow current workers, perhaps even trying some of those tasks hands-on. Of course, first gaining company approval and instructions to do that. And also while observing and learning, remember to strive to listen more than speak. Uh, really showing your role at this stage is to learn from them about their business. And to be successful, I recommend you aim for something like an 80 to 20 ratio of listening to speaking. Okay, now the basic procedures for job carving. We're going to select these seven steps that you see on the screen uh, in detail. So, uh, the, you know, the first is to select the work to be studied. Second, to record facts about their present methods of, of doing 
uh, these tasks. Thirdly, to analyze the tasks and then the sequences really within those tasks very critically. Uh, fourthly, we want to help uh, the business look at a, a, you know, the most effective, we want to develop the most, what we consider the most effective methods to get the, getting those tasks done. And then we, we want to look at a way to kind of sell this new method to the employer, these new methods. Um, and after, you know, once once that's been accomplished, then the, the next step is to help install these new methods and a training program uh, for your student uh, or students. And then finally, to maintain and fine tune this plan, this this new way of doing things uh, via and plenty of follow up and ongoing observation. So again, we'll, we'll talk about these seven in detail now in the set next seven slides. And it's helpful to remember an old engineering principle. Record the new procedure and compare it with the old one. If it is judged to be superior, use it. All right, so we're gonna look at those first two steps now of selecting the tasks and recording uh, information about them. So. Uh, to, you know, selecting, we want to select select uh, those subtasks that appear to be a good match with what the employer needs and, and what our students are interested in and, and have the skills to do. So um, we want to rely heavily on our initial job analysis information on, on you know, for the employer needs uh, part. Um, and we also want to rely on our student assessment information about their skills and interests um, to guide this initial step of selecting those work tasks for study. And then secondly, now for the step of, of recording uh, that, you know, we're looking at sequence and process within key tasks and whether things are modifiable. We, we want to look at rate and speed requirements and possible workarounds. We want to look at things uh, like the workstation layout, the positioning of tools or, uh, you know, equipment. And then, you know, within that, thinking about potential aids. And then finally, materials and environment, looking at any safety or sensory concerns, any possible adaptations there. So um, we want to use, in order to accomplish this big task of recording all of this, is we want to use things like existing uh, job descriptions. Some places may even have what they call a workflow description. We want to observe and take notes, uh, even take photos if, if that's allowed there. Uh, we want to note whether workers use any jigs or fixtures to aid in completing tasks. And we want to note the paths of, of workers and also of materials, the kind of the flow of of people and materials through that workplace. Are there any um, ergonomic issues in terms of those you know, workstations or tasks? Um, you know, looking at the body position that workers typically use there, and are there any concerns there for, you know, that you'd have for your students and whether, you know, that's uh, um, modifiable. Take note of any potential issues with things like lighting, heat, uh, cold, noise, et cetera. And, you know, within that, are there any potential hazards for the student worker and, and um, do workers use protective equipment or devices? All right, so now we want to look at the next step, which is to analyze all this uh, information we've recorded. And to analyze, we want to use a series of why questions. You know, what is done and why? Who does it and why? Where is it done and why? When is it done and why? And how is it done and why? And these why questions can lead to can it questions like, can it be eliminated? Can it be combined? Can it be simplified? Can it be rearranged or improved? So next we're going to develop a new method. And the, uh, the strategy we're gonna use is to eliminate all unnecessary work, combine elements as feasible, things that make sense to go together, uh, simplify elements as, fe as feasible. Again, if, we, if there are some steps that are kind of superfluous or, or not uh, needed, we'll eliminate those. Uh, we want to change or rearrange the method sequence and assignment of operations uh, to meet the employer's needs and create a doable, satisfying student job. Uh, so, you know, within that, the plan might include some, some minor equipment or environment modifications. So um, this stage of planning uh, might involve writing some new job descriptions and helping uh, to develop some success criteria within that. You know, how does the, the employer um, measure that your, your student worker is doing it correctly? Um, ideally, this will lead to some enhanced job descriptions for coworkers as well. Uh, you know, if, if, for instance, if some tasks get pulled uh, from current workers, 
um, to be more efficient and, and given to your student worker, that may involve some tweaking in, in those uh, job descriptions for coworkers as well. And, and hopefully some increased efficiency for everybody at that workplace. So once we've developed the plan, we're going to try to sell it to that employer. And really what we're selling is both a new method for doing uh, these particular tasks, and also we're selling them on the services that, that come with it, the services that your program um, uh, can offer. So uh, first, um, we're going to talk about this using a, a technique called FAB, Features, Advantages, and Benefits. It's a sales approach commonly used in the business world. Uh, we're going to discuss what I like to call the FAB Plus approach, which adds costs and proof to the list. So uh, when we're talking features, we're really talking about the physical characteristics of your plan and uh, your services. Um, in terms of advantages, there we're discussing what the related features do and how they perform. Uh, each feature generally will have more than one advantage to it. Um, next, when we're, we're talking benefits, that would be a summary of what the advantages mean to the business in positive terms, so very specific benefits they're going to gain from this plan. Um, and then the costs, that, that really is, um, it's an honest assessment of what's going to be asked of the employer. Um, it really, it's, it's a summary of some potential disadvantages for them. For, you know, for example, we've already alluded to that there may be a, a somewhat extended training period that would be needed for your student to uh, work or to learn the job. Uh, there may be a little staff time involved in that in terms of uh, other staff members who may need to observe or, or lend some help to the training period. Um, there may be a possible rework as we applied to some of the job descriptions. So that, that would involve a little work for the employer. If, you know, you might be able to help craft that student job description, but they may prefer to recraft, uh, they probably will prefer to recraft their own job descriptions for the other workers and in, 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 in any ways those would change. Um, and then finally, proof. Really, it's examples you can give them uh, about your program and its track record. Uh, you might, for instance, have some actual kind of testimonials uh, that you can can offer to them or people you could connect them with from, uh, you know, maybe there's a related type of business you've worked with before in the area who would uh, be willing to talk with them or give or give some kind of a, a thumbs up to your to your program and your set of services. All right. So next, we're going to talk about installing. The program. So um, some keys to that, uh, you, you want to be ready and willing to offer help to introduce the idea to coworkers. So, and, and hopefully you, you've done some of this along the way as far as, you know, building relationships uh, as you've been there to observe and to kind of create the plan. Um, and we've already implied that you want to kind of be looking to recruit some possible help from those coworkers who seem open to that and most um, kind of logical to approach for that. Um, and so there, there you want to be looking at how, we, how you can help those coworkers adapt to this change. Um, you want to install an excellent training plan. It's got to be a great plan uh, that can help your student to get up to speed, <clears throat> hopefully, uh, you know, fairly, fairly quickly. And then you want to time it carefully and have some, some contingency plans or backup plans, um, in, you know, for those kind of uh, you know, inevitable bumps in the road, you might see. So, uh, you know, homework and groundwork really pay off at this stage. Um, if you have a good plan and have made good allies along the way, then you've set the stage for installing the plan well. Um, also, timing, as, I, as, I, as we've just discussed, is very important. You need to realize change is often very difficult for people and organizations. So be sure not to rush things along in your zeal to help your student get started. Um, be aware also of the weekly, monthly, or seasonal demands of the business and strive to time the start date accordingly so that your student is positioned really well to succeed. All right, next we come to maintaining this new method. So um, some steps you might consider the here are first off, um, Plenty of follow-up. Um, you want to be ready to tweak the, the training uh, or implementation plan uh, uh, quickly if needed. You want to verify that your student worker is thriving. You know, you kind of be able to kind of check their, their uh, weather report on how they're doing. And then um, 
ensure that the, uh, you want to obviously help ensure that the employer's criteria are being met by this new method you have proposed. So uh, you want to be sure to be very, very present and responsive, particularly in the earliest stages of the plan. So especially during that, that uh, you know, kind of proverbial uh, probationary period of the first uh, three months. You want to frequently check in with the student, the job coach, uh, the managers, coworkers, uh, respond to problems proactively. Be prepared for those inevitable bumps in the road. Uh, so, uh, you know, like when that um, uh, honeymoon stage is over. So, uh, you know, uh, when some of the the newness wears off, and when tasks or or coworkers may change, it could be another possible bump in the road. Or uh, when the job coaching fade out plan begins, when that job coach starts to be less present there. Uh, at the site could be another time to be on the lookout for any you know possible uh, problems. All right, so now in summary, uh, we'll we'll kind of wrap things up here in in kind of revisiting some of what we've talked about. So there are these five important factors to consider, <clears throat> uh, which again they're considerations both for student assessment and for job site analysis. We discussed that job process or that job analysis process in detail. And we looked at important considerations within all five of these factors. So as you develop your own system for job analysis, please keep these five factors in mind, uh, remembering that that fifth factor, culture of the workplace, can be a sometimes overlooked, yet a very key consideration. All right, now we also want to review the basic procedures we just looked at for job carving, uh, these, these seven factors. Of, of that kind of deeper dive beyond our initial job analysis uh, to look at, at a potential job carving situation that, that we you know, see might be at, at available at, at a given site based on just some of those, you know, our students' skills and interests and also on performance aspects that we think might be, um, you know, that we might develop some go-arounds for, some workarounds for. All right, and then finally, I want to revisit this overall process that we had talked about. So let's recall this slide where we looked at, you know, first gathering student profile information, including observations at the work site uh, or at work experience sites, rather, and in inputs from multiple people. Um, we talked about gathering information about potential employers, including on-site job analysis. We talked about looking for the best matches. So using both our business information and the student information that we gathered. And then finally, we wanna consider possible plans for job modifications, uh, which might include job carving, and which should include also a proposed set of well-developed training plans. All right, so thanks very much for your interest in this topic. Um, my closing slide here is a set of different resources. Um, that were important to this presentation. Um, you know, I also hope these resources will assist you in your efforts to provide excellent career and vocational services to the young people you have the honor of working with. Thank you for your interest in this topic, for the important work that you do. And please consider allowing uh, our center, the Illinois Center for Transition and Work, to help you further uh, and to bolster you in your work uh, with and for students with disabilities in whatever ways we can. Thank you again.